Well, uh, dzień dobry, dziękuję. Uh, ja będę dzisiaj uh, rozmawiać uh, o tema, który uh, uh, nikt uh, nie ma, i, uh, nie, uh, nie miała uh, i teraz nie ma uh, rzeczywiście i nie ma mieście w naszym nowym normalności. Ja nie mówię o swoje umiejętności w języku polskiego. Uh, to jak wy uh, słyszeli, uh, to, sl słyszacie, to jest uh, katastrofalne. Ja mówię o, ja mówię o, o drugiej uh, koncepcji, uh, Europa Wschodnia. So for those of you who don't speak Polish, and maybe for those of you who do and don't understand my Polish, um, I want to talk today about a concept which doesn't exist anymore, a concept which I may say I've been devoting the last 30 years of my life to, um, but I think it's now time to get rid of. And that concept is Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is a concept that started with the Cold War and the Iron Curtain. And it sort of made sense then. It really meant Eastern-ruled Europe rather than Eastern Europe, because, as you can see, Prague is to the west of Vienna, Helsinki is on the same uh, longitude as Tallinn, and there were bits of Eastern Europe which were like Yugoslavia, which were not really under Soviet rule, Albania, which was also not under Soviet rule. So even then, it was a pretty untidy concept. But it sort of made sense. Western Europe basically free, Eastern Europe basically not. But since the fall of the Iron Curtain, this term has stayed. It's become a kind of lazy, anachronistic shorthand. Very handy for journalists, for commentators, for economists, even for politicians, who want to try and talk down I think, the countries of the East. The idea is that this is a place where people are very poor, where politics is very unstable, which is not really integrated into the European mainstream, um, a country which is a bit weird, a bit different. It's Eastern Europe. It's almost used as a, as a term of abuse. You know, the food was really bad. It was like East European. This, incidentally, is a Roma settlement um, somewhere in Serbia, I think outside, outside Novi Sad. And for many people, that, they would say, yeah, that looks kind of East European. And I think this is totally out of date and unfair. And if you start off just looking at the economics, because I work for the economists, and so we always, always like the numbers. Okay, so Eastern Europe is not poor. There are East European countries, so-called East European countries like Slovenia, which are richer than some countries in Western Europe. More important is the trajectory. All the ten members, the new members of the EU, or new-ish, because it's not that new now, have deficits that are falling and economies that are growing. There's not one of them, not even Hungary, is in the same basket case category as Greece, which is supposedly a West European country. So the economics is, I think, beyond doubt, it no longer means anything to say Eastern Europe. But it's not just e economics, it's culture as well. You all know who this is. I don't need to tell you, this audience. But I'm just going to whiz through. These are the people from this supposedly obscure, marginal, not in the mainstream part of Europe. That was Copernicus, for those of you who don't know. Chopin, Liszt, Dostoevsky, Conrad, Homish to Crackle, Marie Curie, Kundera, Kafka, Kandinsky, Chagall. I just started off with the C's and the K's, then add another two. But you, can, you, could, you could really fill a whole talk just putting up pictures of people from this supposedly marginal, non-mainstream part, uh, part of Europe. Then let's look at security. There's the idea that Eastern Europe is this kind of vulnerable bit of Europe that consumes security and doesn't provide it. Again, not true. Countries in Eastern Europe tend to spend more on security than those in Western Europe. You've got countries like... Um, Poland and Estonia, which are nearly up to 2% of GDP. You've also got countries like Slovakia and Lithuania, which are pretty much given up. You've got countries that are neurotic neutrals, like Ukraine, supposedly Eastern Europe. You've got countries which are ardent Atlanticists, like the Czech Republic or the Baltic States. So there's no security conception in which Eastern Europe makes sense. And I think that the key point to remember here is that it's about integration. Eastern Europe is integrated into Western Europe to the point the, conception, the concept doesn't make sense anymore. Look at NATO. You have so-called West European countries like Ireland, Switzerland, Austria, Finland, Sweden, which are not in NATO. You've got all the EU10 are in NATO, and you've got countries outside the EU10 which are trying to join. So it isn't to do with NATO. It's not to be Schengen. When I arrived from Britain yesterday, I went as a non-Schengen visitor into the Schengen Zone. The Schengen Zone includes lots of East European countries 
and it excludes countries like Britain, which are not, not in Schengen. So it's not about that. It's not about the euro. We've got three East European countries, Slovenia, Slovakia, and, uh, and Estonia, which are in the euro, and you've got Denmark, Sweden, Britain, Switzerland, which are outside. So I can see no sense in which this category makes sense. And in fact, there's one little test I want to do. There is only one country in Europe, one country, which is a member of both the EU and of NATO and obeys the rules of both those clubs. It meets the debt and deficit and inflation criteria for the Eurozone, and it's in the Euro, and it also meets NATO's rule of 2% of GDP on um, going on defence spending. One country, this is a country that was not even on the map 20 years ago, well, 20 years and two months ago, um, a country which people wrote off as just another East European basket case. Anyone guess which country that is? The one country in Europe, in NATO, which actually meets the rules. Correct. Very good. You win a prize. Um, now, if we don't have Eastern Europe anymore as a concept, and I think we, um, we shouldn't, what do we have instead? Well, I think we should have some new categories. This, for example, is the old Hanseatic League, a uh, kind of you know, very early free trading version of the, of, of the Free U, based on cities, really, rather than countries. And I think Baltic Europe kind of makes sense. It's not just that the people around the Baltic Sea all eat herring with boiled potatoes, which people tend not to. It actually you can stretches down to, down to Holland as well, but they eat, uh, they, they eat herring there as well. But these are countries which are mainly Protestant, although obviously Poland is an exception, but they all are, um, they have solvent, strong, stable governments. They are instinctively free trading, they're instinctively open, and nowadays they're all pretty worried about Russia. And it's a major part of NATO's thinking, is thinking about Baltic security in a way that actually involves supposedly non-NATO Sweden and Finland. So I think Baltic Europe kind of makes sense. Um, I think another one that makes sense is Danube Europe. This is the great European river, and you can see if you just take the Danube itself, then that's Germany, Austria, Hungary, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, and if you want to be very kind, a tiny little bit of Moldova. If you include the tributaries to the Danube, it includes other bits of ex-Yugoslavia and, um, and, 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 and the Czech Republic uh, as, as well. So I think Danube Europe kind of makes sense. In fact, the Hungarian presidency made a big thing in the first six months of the year of promoting Danube Europe. Another one on a slightly less happy thing, this is a German map, just to show I'm not uh, um, trying to you know, make the Anglosphere the dominant cultural hegemon. This is Roma Europe. This is the, um, the tints show the percentage of Roma population. Again, this is not... Roma is a terrible European social problem. Um, very bad education, very bad housing, lots of discrimination, lots of criminality, very high birth rate, a really big problem, particularly, I think, for, for our children going forward. The failure to do Roma integration. But again, it's not just an East European problem. Spain, big Roma population, done pretty well with it. Turkey, big Roma population. Also, the traditional, some of the traditional East European countries, but then, again, not others. I, um, I think that what we're now seeing is a new emerging pole in Europe. And I say pole not because of Poland, because it's a pole of attraction. And that is the countries, roughly the ones around the Baltic Sea, which I showed you, but adding to that, Austria, uh, Switzerland, Slovenia, Czech Republic, and Slovakia. And those are countries which all have a lot of things in common. They are stable, politically, no worries about weird extremist parties. We have those worries a bit further east, a bit further south, and a bit further west, but in that core chunk of Europe, you have basically stable politics. You have strong economies. No one anywhere near a bailout. No one's worried about credit ratings. The credit ratings are going up. Basically, these ones around here, the Baltic and, the ch this and, and, and Central Europe. And they have, so they have strong economies. Their credit ratings are either stable or improving. And some of these supposedly East European basket cases now have much stronger credit ratings than even uh, really serious founder members of the Euro um, uh, and of the EU, like Italy. So you've got strong economies, you've got strong politics. You've got a sense of confidence and a sense of internationalism. And then around that blob in the middle, which in my uh, map was coloured nice bright blue, uh, we then have a kind of red horseshoe. 
the red horseshoe is countries that have either wobbly economies or wobbly politics or both. It starts with Russia. I can't say actually Russian politics is terribly wobbly. It's all too predictable. It's a case of one man, one vote. A man's called Vladimir Vladimirovich. Um, there's an electorate of two, but the other guy's vote doesn't count. And so he's just voted himself back in. So you've got Russia. You've got Ukraine, again, um, going very far, sadly backwards. You've got Romania and Bulgaria with quite serious problems. You've got ex-Yugoslavia problems. And then you go south to Italy, again, with Berlusconi, who if, if he was an East European leader, everybody would saying, oh, of course, you know, that's so East European, this overlap between politics and business and this guy who runs a media empire. And he's very corrupt. And he's in with organized crime. And you know, Berlusconi would make a perfect cartoon character as an East European leader. But actually, he's the Prime Minister of Italy. Then you've got, you've got Spain. You've got Portugal, both in terrible difficulty. Some people would say that the one thing that Eastern Europe still has is that it takes a lot of money from the West. And that's kind of true. In the 2007 to 2013 financial perspective in the EU, tens of billions of euros went east to build new roads, the new bridge, which I came across today in Krakow. Very nice. Big change from when I was a student here um, 25 years ago. Um, the traffic's changed as well. Um, so so you've got, you've got some, you have a very big transfer um, from, east, for, from west to east. But those sums are dwarfed. They're dwarfed by the size of the bailout. You know, in one EU summit meeting, they sort of think, oh, well, 100 billion, maybe not enough. 200 million, 300 million, make it half a trillion. That should, that, that should do the trick. These gigantic sums, which are going to bail out Greece and, by implication, Spain and Portugal and Italy and maybe Belgium. Right? The bailout of Dexia alone I think was more than one e the, the, I think than Poland received in an entire year from, from the EU. So I don't even think this, uh, this idea of, of, of Eastern Europe as the um, recipient makes sense. So, Europa Wschodnia Niema. It's time to put this anachronistic, damaging, disparaging, irrelevant, conceptually flawed idea of Eastern Europe in the dustbin. Let's deal with the countries of Europe as they are, and if we make categories, make them real ones with real common characteristics. Thank you very much.